My name is Pastor Dustin, youth pastor here at Watford City Assembly of God. If I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, it's a great honor to be in front of you today to bring the word. Uh, we are wrapping up our summer series, uh, the book of Acts, and uh, we're not wrapping up actually the book of Acts, we're only halfway through it, but this is the end of our summer series as we've been walking through the book of Acts, and so I'm, I'm honored to bring uh, the word to you today. Uh, and so this morning we're going to find ourselves in the book of Acts chapter 13 verses 44 through chapter 14 verse 7. So that's where you can hang out in your text this morning, whether it's your physical Bible or it's a, an electronic Bible, uh, but that's where we're going to be hanging out. But before we kind of get into that this morning, I just uh, want to uh, kind of just kind of gauge you guys where you're at. Uh, anybody in here love a good steak, like a just a good steak? Now if you're not a meat eater, please don't be offended, Okay. Um, it's just a great analogy for where we're going, all right? Uh, there are certain cuts of the steak that when it's, when it's, just, when it's grilled properly and it's, it's there and you put it in your mouth, it like, you don't have to even chew. It just like kind of melts and deteriorates, right? Like it's just good. And then there are certain cuts that have a little bit more fatty in them, that fatty tissue. And so you're, I mean, you're not going to throw it out. You're not going to cut it out. You eat it, you, you, you kind of you power through and it's, it's steak. It's good. But there are parts where you actually have to chew on it just a little bit longer to get through it, okay? This morning, in our word, there is a lot of of valuable uh, uh, scripture and insight in what we're going to be covering this morning. Uh, There's a lot of cuts that are going to be landing really well with you, and they're going to be like that first part of that steak that is just prime and just good. And there are going to be parts where it's kind of like the ribeye and there's, there's a little bit of fat that you've got to get through and there's a little bit of chewing that's going to take a little bit. There's going to be some things this morning in the Word of God that you may wrestle with, that God may be speaking to you. But this morning, as Pastor Sheldon has continued to say through the entire sermon series, that this is the Word of God and if it's in the Word of God, this is what we believe and this is what we're holding to. And so this morning, as we kind of go through this, I just want to encourage you that if you find yourself in a place where you are kind of chewing on the word and you're kind of just like really wrestling with what's going on, to bring it before the Lord and allow the Lord to do a work within you and to, to continue to, to challenge you to, to go further in your relationship with him. Okay, so I just want to make that kind of comparison this morning. But I also want to give us a, a quick recap. And, and uh, last week we realized that, that many people, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, come to find out who Jesus is through the gospel message. Paul and Barnabas are preaching the gospel message, the good news, to, to, to those that are here. And we see that many come to know who Jesus is. Many do. But as Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, points out, he notes that there is a greater response in the Gentiles than there are in the Jews. And many devout Jews, there, there's a reason that both responded for a couple reasons, and we're going to kind of go through that right now, is this. Both Jews and Gentiles responded. Many of the Jews had been following Paul and Barnabas. They were very interested in their message. So they've been raised in church, or they're not church, but they're raised in their faith. They've been instructed in their faith, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. They, uh, they were structured in many of their ways, hiding God's word in their heart. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is something that they literally went over and 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 over again in their own lives. And then they instilled it into their kids' lives and their family li- families' lives and everybody else around them. So they had studied the Word of God. They had studied the Torah. They had gone through everything, figuring out the Word of the Lord. And so they were very intrigued and interested to hear what Paul and Barnabas were having to say. So they were following them around, getting uh, interested in their message. And it's interesting to me that far too many times we, we, we look at, at the very end of that scripture, it talks about the grace. And they encourage, the, they encourage Paul and Barnabas to continue on with grace. Far too many times we think that grace is only be the beginning of our walk with God. We think that grace is only the beginning of our walk with God. Anybody ever have a hard time like really having an understanding between grace and mercy? Like you kind of get them confused as to what it is? No, I'm the only one that had that issue. All right, uh, so when I was a teenager... Uh, the way that I'd figure out the difference between grace and mercy is simply this. Anybody ever played the game Mercy where you lock hands with somebody and you're going to try to overpower them and bend their wrist back and their arm back? Jude, I know you've done that. Uh, So we're going to play, we play that game, right? Mercy is me saying, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. You locked arms with me, you locked hands, and I'm going to break your arm. And so until you say mercy, I'm actually going to show you a little bit of mercy and say, you know what, I'm not going to do what you deserve. You shouldn't have locked arms with me because now trouble's coming. Grace. Grace is a gift 
of what we don't deserve. Mercy is, I'm not going to give you what you do deserve. Grace is, I'm going to give you a gift that you do not deserve. And so we look at the gift of Jesus, the grace that we find with God, that he sent his only son to die on the cross for every single one of us, that we should have relationship with him, that we should receive him as Lord of our lives, as, as Savior of our lives. We don't deserve a Savior. We fall short, is what God's word says. We are all sinners. But because Jesus came, because that grace that God brought, he's giving us a free gift. A gift that we don't deserve, and his name is Jesus. But far too many, we find grace only at the beginning of our walk with God, but we need to understand that God wants grace to remain as the foundation for our life that is found in him. And the reason being, guys, is you will never get to a place where you can pay off the debt that we owe to God. You will never be able to get to a place to pay off that free gift that was given to you. You can't pay it off. It was a free gift. There is nothing that matches to the gift of Jesus. And so it's so important for us to recognize that God wants grace to remain as our foundation for our life in him. So we see the Gentiles, they're recognizing the grace that has been given to them. They're recognizing that Jesus, the message that's being preached, is not just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles as well. It's for everyone. So there's a big response. We see many Jews and Gentiles come to the Lord. And we see that the Gentiles beg that these words, the sermon, would be preached the next week. They're begging Paul and Barnabas to come back and to preach, to give a sermon to preach about Jesus, the Savior. So as we dive in, Acts 13, 44, this is what it says. It'll be on the screen behind me uh, in the New Living Translation. It says this, The following week, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. It's a pretty easy scene to picture, right? The entire, almost the entire city shows up. And they were ready to hear the gospel from Paul and Barnabas. Can you imagine Watford City, like the, almost the entire city showing up to hear the gospel of Jesus preached? That would be awesome. That would be amazing. That's what we pray for when we pray for revival, isn't it? Is that there would be a moment where there is an opportunity for all to respond to who Jesus is and the free gift that he brings. So the entire city, they show up. They're here to hear what, what Paul and Barnabas have to say. In today, in our, in our day and age, we are overwhelmed with information through TV, through newspapers, through the radio, especially social media. There's all kinds of different ways that we are overwhelmed with information. And, and obviously, they didn't have these sources of information back then. So to get an understanding as to why and the, the entire city would really show up for the missionaries Paul and Barnabas to show up is simply because that when somebody showed up that was a messenger, they were, a equal of, uh, they, were, they were equal to a source of valuable information. So the reason that we see a large group gathering is because there was valuable information that these two were bringing and so many come to hear and to find out what that message is. Now take that excitement of some, uh, of, of some that knew the value of the new information, but it's important for us also to take note that it's not just new valuable information that they're receiving, but it is the power of the word of the Lord. And you can see why then the entire city would be drawn to hear that message of salvation. If you look back to 44, it says, the following week almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. There is power that is found in the word of the Lord. There is power that is in the word that is in your hand in the word of God. There is power to transform and change lives because of the power of the word of God. And so it's important for us to recognize that it's not just information. It's just not new information. It is the power of the word of the Lord that is transforming and changing lives. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says this, Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think that it was our words as mere human ideas, but you accept what was said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. 
the recognition that they recognize it then, and I hope you recognize it today, that it's not my words, but it is the word of the Lord that is being preached. It is the word of God that is, that is being said. So as we continue on, chapter 13, verse 45, it says this. But when some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous. So they slandered Paul and argued against whatever he had said. You guys ever been in that position where you find yourself in opposition to what's being taught, what's being said, what's going on, and you find yourself no longer, it's no longer like the voice in your head that's arguing with what's going on. You find yourself being a little bit verbal and you're saying it out loud and you're hoping that somebody near you kind of hears what you're saying, that, hey, I know what I'm talking about. I, we need to change your way of thinking type thing. And then it gets louder and a little bit louder and then you find yourself kind of belligerent. I hope that's not you. I hope, yeah, I hope you've never done that. But I think that there we find ourselves occasionally in a position where we do try to voice our opinion and we find ourselves in these arguments that we, we, we want people to know that we know what we're talking about, right? We want people to know that I know what I'm talking about. And so we find ourselves here with this, this uh, in scripture where the Jews, they saw the crowds, they saw what was happening and it made them very angry. Why would they be angry at Paul? If we look back and we remember in the book of Acts, we see that Paul used to be Saul who was the leader of the Pharisees. He was one of the religious leaders of the Jews. And he was the one that persecuted the church. He was the one that murdered Christians. So they got a lot of dirt on this dude, Paul. So they know who he is, right? Anybody ever have a problem with, and I, please don't respond. I'm just trying to get you to think. But have you ever had a problem with somebody that you knew their past life and what they were doing and then they came to Jesus and you kind of struggle with the fact that they're with Jesus and you're like, man, I know who you were. I know what you did. Are you sure your relationship's real? Is this not what the Jews are doing to Paul and Barnabas? They're calling into question every single thing. They're slandering Paul and they're arguing against everything that he said because they know better and they know who he used to be. They're coming against him in opposition. For the Jews and their following, they could accept the message as God sent. They could tolerate, keyword tolerate, some change. But they could not deal with the fact that the Gentiles should be made equal with God's holy ancient people, the Jews themselves. The thing that they struggled with, the thing that they wrestled with, the thing that they could not come to grips with is the fact that Jesus came and he died for all people. That he died that all would be equal under him. And that's what they had a problem with. Guys, the very first sermon that I ever preached here at WCAG six years ago was on Jonah. And I was talking about not being like Jonah and not being a missionary and God tells us to go do something and we turn around and run the opposite way. And I'll never forget that they, I was in Walmart and I saw a young lady that I went to high school with and I felt the Lord really prompting me and saying, you should go speak to her and to witness and share me with her. And I was like, yeah, that's not happening. I ain't doing that. I knew who she was in high school. And I was giving an answer for her to God saying, yeah, she's not worthy of that. I know who she was. I know what she did. I'm not going to go share you with her. And I didn't. And that has stuck with me ever since. Not because it torments me and, and, and it's there to, to bring me down. But it's a solid reminder in my life that I can't give a person's answer for them, that that is their job. My job is simply just to present who Jesus is and the gospel of Jesus, and it's their job to receive. It's their job to reject, not mine. That's not my choice. And I thank God that nobody did that for me and wrote me off and said, no, they're not worthy of that. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. The Jews can't get over the idea that the Gentiles are to be equal because God created all of them, loves all of them, and wants all of them to spend eternity with him. So it's so easy for us to find ourselves jealous of others and what God is doing in and through them. We could even tie this into ministry where we see churches. Churches become jealous and envious of other churches and what God is doing through their church. And why can't God do that in my church? We start to compare. We start to slander against them. We start to bring them down. Oh, you want to go to that church? They're terrible. Oh, I don't even know if they actually believe in the word of God. Do you hear what they did last week? 
We do it all the time as a Christian body, slandering each other, bringing each other down, talking ill towards another. But it just isn't even there. I've seen it even when we're volunteering. In our hearts, we've been in church our entire life. You've been a volunteer for 20 plus years. And then somebody gets radically saved and transformed. Their life has changed. And they want to get plugged into the church and they want to start volunteering. And they get plugged in. And yet, we think that we should be in some sort of tier in our volunteers. Like, I've earned my right to be here. I put in my time. And we can find ourselves jealous and envious because they just got saved. Who said that they could be right here with me and being on an equal level playing ground of of being a volunteer in my church? These are things that we wrestle with, guys. If we're going to be completely honest and we evaluate where we're at, these are things that we wrestle with. If we're not careful, we find ourselves carrying a religious spirit. And that's exactly what this is, the religious spirit. The Jews rising up against Paul and their jealousy and their slandering and their arguing. It's a religious spirit. And we need to be careful that we don't carry that religious spirit. Guys, it ends up being that it's to the point that some of us end up rejecting Jesus because the way he changes our relationship with other people. The reason that the Jews had issues with this is because God was trying to reconcile them and to bring them together to be one. And their issue was is that they were not equal and they were not one. That there was a separation. And in doing so, they were rejecting Jesus. They were rejecting Jesus because the way he wanted to change our relationship. And whether you're feeling convicted or there's something that God is bringing to your mind right now, there may be areas in our life where we have been doing things in ministry, whatever the case is, as Christians, that we have counted off that person just like I did. We've written them off. And we've got to a place where we are rejecting Jesus because he wants to reconcile those relationships. He wants to change. He wants to bring us to a place where those relationships are mended. And so we end up rejecting Jesus because of the way that he changes our relationships with other people. Think about it, guys. Someone rather hold on to their bitterness and jealousy and opposition towards others than to turn to Jesus and surrender and say, okay, Lord, I want to be reconciled with you and I want to reconcile this relationship or the situation with this other person. We'd rather hold on to our jealousy and our bitterness than reconcile. Acts 13, 46 through 48, Paul and Barnabas respond to the Jews. Verse 46 says this, then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. That word is, I have right here in bold and in highlighted, and it's underlined. They spoke out boldly and declared, it was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews, but since you have rejected it, And judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we will offer it to the Gentiles. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. When reading this portion, guys, of scripture again boldly stands out to me. I mean, it's pretty bold to call out the Jews on their behavior as well as call them out on their eternal destination. That's a bold move to call them out on where they're at and what they're doing and where they're going. I don't know if you know this or not, but the church can be a pretty messy place. We as a church like to think we have our act together. We like to think that it's all good and that only the broken are coming in. But those of us who receive Jesus, we're we're good. But the church can be a messy place. And it should be a messy place because this is where the hurting and the broken come. This is where they come to find who Jesus is. But the church is a messy place, kind of like a a family, right? You think that you look good on the outside. You want people to know that you look good on the outside, but you don't want people to know that you can't continue to have fights and quarreling and that you got in a fight in the car on the way to church this morning. Because who hasn't been there? We want people to think that we have it all together. We want to look good, but there's an understanding that it's not always good and that it is a little bit messy. As a pastor, even a ministry leader, guys, it can be very difficult to address these situations that we don't like confrontation. I don't know about you, but I don't like confrontation. I, have, I, I want to avoid confrontation. My wife would probably would say otherwise. In our house, I do 
I'm probably the confronting one. But outside of that, in ministry, things like that, I hate confrontation. I don't like it. I don't like the way it makes me feel. I don't like it. But sometimes we have to have boldness to address the situations and address what's going on. Otherwise, it continues to, to be what it is. It gets messier. It gets worse. And we have to have the, the, the boldness to, to recognize when God is trying to bring correction and to change things and also to speak that truth in love. And it's so important for us to recognize that here Paul and Barnabas, they call out, they call out the Jews for their nonsense, for their rejection and their judging. Paul and Barnabas, they, they call it the rejection and judgment of themselves as unworthy. Again, guys, that is a bold move. And you better know for sure that the Lord is leading you to speak on those terms if that's the route you're going because you can cause a big mess and a big problem if you're just speaking out of arrogance and thinking, speaking out of your hot head and saying that, oh, this is in the name of the Lord. But when it is the name of the Lord and when it's God is, that is directing you to bring correction, and to speak on such things, be bold and speak truth because we want people to come to know. We want all to come to know who Jesus is and what he's done for them. Moving on, chapter 13, verses 48 says this, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and thanked the Lord for his message. And all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. So we see that the Gentiles... They heard this, they hear the correction that Paul is bringing, they hear what is happening and that he rebukes the the, the Jews and they're very thankful for it. They're thankful for the message of the Lord, that the message makes them equal, that they are not separated, that they are not lower, that they are not, that that they're not just the, the byproduct, that they are equal and that they get to receive Jesus as Lord of their life. They're very thankful for that. They're celebrating that. And so, My attention towards this verse, though, is going to be towards the end of it. And the reason being is there is a spot here where it says, and all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. Depends on what version you have. It can say anointed. It can say um, ordained. It can say chosen. Uh, But this this is where some have viewed this verse as teaching predestination, which is the belief that God has already determined in advance who is going to go to heaven and who is going to go to hell. It takes out completely the idea that you can choose for yourself, that we have free will, and that we can choose whether we want to accept Jesus or not. Predestination takes that out. It's the idea that it's already predetermined, it's already preset, and so what difference does it make? And so when we look at this, Neither the context of this passage or the word chosen, when it's translated into Greek to tasso, would bring us to the conclusion, uh, would bring us to this conclusion. Verse 46 clearly points out human responsibility in accepting and rejecting, rejecting eternal life. If you look back to verse 46, when Paul calls them out, what's he call them out for? Their rejection of God and what God was doing. They basically took out their eternal life. They're they're rejecting what God is. They're making a choice to reject. Okay? Another way of looking at this, uh, or or for, for this reason, a more literal translation of Tasso is this. They were inclined, willing, or prepared to accept. They were inclined, willing, or prepared to accept. Another way of looking at this passage and translation uh, in in the word chosen or ordained or appointed is to the original Greek of the word tasso, which brings us to a more common terminology that we use today, which you may have heard through Pastor Brady or somebody else, which is a divine appointment, where we believe that the Holy Spirit is at work And moving in people's lives and there is a divine appointment. He is preparing them for when this message that is spoken, they can make the choice to respond or not respond. So we're looking at this and the way that we word it is for that, that understanding of being inclined, willing, or prepared to accept. And the Holy Spirit is moving in their life. So you can phrase this verse, verse 48, in this way. When the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad, thanked the Lord for his message. And all who were willing and ready to accept eternal life believed. To back up this scripture and to back up this idea that we're, we're not living a pre, uh, predestination, we're not living down that life, that we have choice, we can find in 1 Timothy uh, 2.8, 
When it talks about God who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. Everyone is the key word, to be saved. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. We can also see that according to Paul in the book of Romans, that no person is unconditionally chosen for eternal life. If you look at Romans eleven twenty through 21, it says this, yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are, uh, you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Is that not a picture of the Jews, the original God's chosen people? And there were those that chose not to accept Jesus and they were broken off. And then you have a picture of the Gentiles, the new branches, the new ones that are coming in, the new vine, and they are there. But there is a warning that they are not highly, they're not above and beyond, they're not anything, they're equal across playing grounds. Because if God broke off the original, he can break off your branch as well. So it's so important for us to recognize and understand that no person is unconditionally chosen for eternal life. That we all are given the option to choose to whether or not we will receive salvation, we will respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will respond to God, and we will do or we won't do. There is no riding the fence. There is one choice or the other. By not making a choice, you're making a choice. You can't ride the fence on this. It's one or the other. And we have to recognize that. Acts 39, or thir- chapter 13, verses 49 through 50 says this. So the Lord's message spread through that region. So it wasn't just the city. The entire city showed up. But because the power of the word of the Lord, the entire region, the word is spreading. Verse 50, then the Jews stirred up influential religious women and leaders in the city and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. You can see that this thing is escalating quickly because the word of the Lord is spreading and it is escalating quickly and that lives are being transformed and changed. And so you see that the Jews are backed up into a corner. So what are they gonna do? They're bringing out their big guns too. We're gonna get influential people. We're gonna get people who have influence over their other people here in the city. We're gonna have those that have a voice in some lives and we're gonna, we're gonna come at this and we're gonna make sure that we can strike this down. So they go after influential religious women and the leaders of the city, men in the city that had, that had a high hierarchy. And so they're coming in, they're citing a mob against Paul and Barnabas to run them out of town. The Lord's word is spreading like wildfire and the Jews are just, they're, they're taking drastic measures to make it stop. But you can't stop the word of the Lord. You can't stop a move of God. God's word will continue to reach who it needs to reach. Isaiah 55, for the word of the Lord, when it is spoken, when it is sent out, it does not return void. It does not come back empty. It accomplishes everything that God has intended it for it to accomplish. And that is truth. That is something to stand on every single time that the word of the Lord accomplishes everything that God intends for it to accomplish. It doesn't come back empty. And so you can see right here that the word of the Lord is not coming back empty, that there is fruit. There is a lot of lives being transformed and changed. So we see that they get run out of town, so that's the end, right? Job's over, job's done. No. Verse 51 through 52, so they shook the dust from their feet as a sign of rejection and went to the town of Iconium. And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We see that they shake their feet. You guys ever like been, again, in that argument or in that position where you just disagree completely and you're just like, you know what? And you kind of do this, you wipe your hands of it. That's basically what it's doing is they're shaking their feet of dust, this dust of the city, where they were, where they walked, they're shaking it off. They're like, you know what? This is on you. 
this is on you. And we can find this teaching in Matthew chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. It's not going to be on the screen. I'm just going to read you the words. But this is when Jesus told the disciples, whenever you enter a city or a village, search for a worthy person and stay at his home until you leave town. When you enter the home, give it your blessing. If it turns out to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it's not, take back the blessing. If any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. I tell you the truth, the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off than such a town on the judgment day. Sodom and Gomorrah is better off. It was annihilated and wiped out. They're better off than towns that reject and those that reject the word of the Lord. I think it's so important in verse 52 when it says the believers, the, the disciples, you're talking about Paul and Barnabas and those that were with them, were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. If we can be honest here, I think the majority of us, sometimes we don't want to share our faith. We don't want to share Jesus and the gospel message with others because of fear of failure. What if they reject what I have to say? What if this damages my friendship with them? What if this dam damages that, that relationship? Well, I don't want them to say no. We have fear in our hearts. We're worried about what the response is going to be. And oftentimes we correlate it to the fact that they're rejecting us. But they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting Jesus. And when you can have that understanding that it's not you they're rejecting, it's rejecting Jesus, it takes a lot of that burden off of you takes a lot of that weight off your shoulders because you're recognizing that it's not me, but it's Jesus they're rejecting. Now that's hard because you want them to have Jesus. We recognize the joy of our salvation. We recognize what Jesus has done for us and we want others to have that as well. We want them to have the joy of the Lord. We want them to experience the freedom and salvation that comes through Jesus. And that can be burdening. That can be hard because you recognize, man, you're rejecting the Lord. You're rejecting this free gift. But that's not for us again to decide. That's for them to make the decision. Our job is to just be faithful and to present what God is asking us to present. To be his word, to be his mouth, to be his feet, to be an extension of his hands. That's what God's asking of us. It's hard to get over that rejection and get over those fears of witnessing Christ. The disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. It's important for us to recognize that in this, even after rejection, even after everything that was going on, they left that city with joy. They were filled with joy. Many came to know Jesus. Many came into a relationship with God. Even though they, dusted the, they, they took the dust and they wiped it away, they walked away with joy and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So important for us that as we continue on, that we recognize uh, this saying. This was the Holy Spirit give this to Pastor Sheldon. I use it a thousand times to his one time. And as probably a literal uh, a account. Um, and so it's simply this. No person or situation can steal your joy. It's yours to relinquish. It's yours to give up. No person or situation can steal your joy. This is a great example of that. No person or situation. There was nothing that was going to steal their joy. It was theirs to give up, and they weren't giving it up. And I feel like so many of us have been robbed of our joy, especially lately. We freely, open-handed, let them take our joy out of our hands. There wasn't even a fight for it. It is your choice. No person or situation can steal your joy. It's yours to give up. Acts chapter 14, verses 1 and 2 says this, The same thing happened in Iconium. Paul and Barnabas went to the Jewish synagogue and preached with such power that a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. Some of the Jews, however, spurned God's message and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. Man, it's like we just read this before in the last chapter, didn't we? Paul and Barnabas go to the next city. They go, they preach the word of God. Lives are transformed and changed. And because lives are transformed and changed and they're preaching, they first preach in the synagogue to the Jews, but then they obviously reach out to the Gentiles and here comes the rejection. So much so that the Jews, they, they continue to, they, they poison the minds of the Gentiles speaking against pa Paul and Barnabas. And guys, we are our own worst enemy, especially as Christians, because we can do a pretty good job by the words that we speak, by how we live our life and what we do, where our witness isn't as effective because we've poisoned minds by what we say and how we live our life outside of the church. And that's a dangerous place to be. 
So some Jews, however, spurned God's message and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. What we need to recognize, though, is that the lives of both Jews and Gentiles were changed because, again, the power that is found in the word of the Lord. It is the power that is found in the word word of the Lord every single time. Successful ministry creates opposition. Successful ministry creates opposition and not our ministry, but God's ministry. And when God is successful, and he is, it creates opposition every time. Acts 14.3 says this, but the apostles stayed there for a long time preaching boldly. Again, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. So the only thing that we're seeing different right now besides what they've been doing before is, is we see that the Lord was proving their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. One thing uh, that that is true is, is there is nothing that you can argue with when you see for yourself the proof that is in the pudding. When you are in an argument and all of a sudden your eyes are open to the reality of what's going on because you just saw proof, your argument's kind of dead in the water. And how many of you, we know that there are those, maybe it's us, where we just want to continue to argue for the sake of arguing even though we know we're wrong and now it's proven that we're wrong. Was that Jude that did that? Yeah, it was Jude. Uh, figures. He, he's, he's a good one at arguing for the sake of arguing. <laughs> but we want to argue for the sake of arguing, Right? It's so important, guys, that we recognize that the power of the Lord was shown and so that people could see. Not only were they hearing the power of the word of the Lord, they were seeing the power of the Lord. They were seeing God move mightily. I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of miracles in my time in following Jesus. I have seen deaf ears open. I have seen blind eyes. When I was in Mexico as a teenager, we were praying over a man who literally was sitting in the corner, listening to the message, and his eyes, he was blind, and they were all the same color. Basically, glossed, you could just see the fog glossed over. And as we were praying, we witnessed as those eyes cleared up, and you could see his pupils, you could see the iris, you could see everything, and he began to see. I've seen legs that have grown into place where they've been offset and you watch as the leg grows and it becomes the same size as the other. Guys, this last summer at youth, at at camp, we saw God, God move mightily through our students and we saw the Holy Spirit moving in their lives and something that was very nerve wracking for a lot of teenagers and especially for North Dakotans that don't like God to be a little extravagant, extravagant, a little over the top, we saw people being slain in the spirit and there were a lot of people like, I don't know about this. But here's what I can tell you is that when the signs of miraculous wonders goes through and it's God moving, that there is no arguing with what God is doing when you begin to see what he's doing and it matches up with his word. And there came a point where many of our students were so open to the move of God that they were willing to receive whatever the Holy Spirit imparted upon them. And it was amazing. It was something that I hadn't experienced in a long, long time. But it's so important for us, guys, that we recognize the power that God has given us for signs, wonders, and miracles, and that it matches up and it brings proof. Not only that we have the power of the word of God, but we have visual power we can see. I don't know about, the only reason I bring this up is because it was the greatest comparison in my, in my mind, right? I love the movie Elf, right? And so um, there is the, the, the sleigh, and it's supposed to be off of their belief in Santa. And so they have a rocket booster underneath that keeps the sleigh going because there's just not a lot, a lot of people that believe in Santa. Rightfully so. Uh, so... <laughs> So they have the clausometer on there, right? And so there's a point where they're trying to get the sleigh off the ground, sleigh off the ground, and all of a sudden they fly over the entire large group that's singing carols. As soon as they see the sleigh fly over the group, all of a sudden that clausometer goes from one end and spikes to the other and they take off shooting in the air because everybody believed. And all that made me think of is when you see signs, wonders, and miracles that come with the word of the Lord and you see God moving and you seeing people's lives cha- transformed and changed physically, you're seeing that, your faith goes from being on the empty side and spiking to the other side immediately and there is nothing that changes when you're like, okay, that just happened. 
Anybody else see what just happened? Because I just saw what. Did you see that just happen? Our faith honor goes wham just to the other side. And it is hard for us to come off of that because we recognize and we've seen how faithful God is and what he's been doing. And some of us are at the point where everything has been so heavy lately because of COVID, because of, of tsunamis, because of the weather and, the, and the, just the drought that's going on and all the problems that it causes, everything that's going on in Afghanistan and the Middle East, all these things that are happening and we are weighed down and we are depressed and we are feeling so much pressure. And yet I know that God wants to bring faith and restore joy this morning. And there is a lack of joy. There is a lack of faith. And God wants to restore that in some of you this morning. And so that's what we're going to be seeking here in a moment. If the worship team would make their way out, we're getting ready to wrap up here. So the apostles spent a long time there preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And he proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. Verse 4. But the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. Some sided with the Jews and some sided with the apostles. That's a bummer to read, especially after you see that there was signs following the word of the Lord. But as, that is the reality. Again, choices being made. Where we have the choice and they were making choices and they were choosing what side they were going to be on. They chose with the Jews or the apostles. And we have to make a choice when we walk out of this room today as to whether or not we're going to be faithful to the Lord in his leading or not. But that is your choice to make. I can't make that choice for you, nor can you make the choice for me as to what my decision is going to be. But we have to choose. And we see here that they chose, and they chose sides. Verse 5 says, Then a mob of Gentiles and Jews, along with their leaders, decided to attack and stone them. And when the apostles learned of this, they fled the region to Laconia, to the towns of Lystra and Derbe in the surrounding area. And then they kicked their feet up and they chilled and they said, we did good. That's not what verse 7 says, is it? Verse 7 says, and they preached the good news. They continued. The one thing that really stands out to me through this entire time is as they jumped from city to city and they went wherever the Lord led them, they continued to do the same thing. They preached the power of the word of the Lord and lives were transformed and changed. There wasn't a point where they got to and they said, oh, finally, we're done. They continued until they were martyred. They continued to share the word of the Lord to anybody who would listen. And that is part of our responsibility today is to respond to the word of the Lord and then to share. So I'm gonna ask that you guys would stand. We're gonna go into this last worship song. I'm gonna ask that you would just really enter in Uh, and to to just think about the words that you're singing, the words that you're declaring to the Lord. But then halfway through this song, I'm going to come back and kind of give direction because we're going to open the altars this morning for for many different things. And so I just want you to prepare. And the reason that we want to sing part of the song is because, again, I want your hearts to be prepared for what God wants to do in and through your life this morning. And if you don't want to respond up here, we're just going to encourage you to continue to to sing along and to, to worship. And then when that song is over, you guys are free to go and enjoy the rest of your weekend on this holiday weekend. Uh, But this morning, we don't want you to leave here without responding to the word of the Lord and what God may be laying on your heart this morning. So we're going to go into the song, and then again here in a minute, I'll give some more direction as to what we're doing. But for the time being, uh, I'm just going to pray, and then we'll go into the song. Lord, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you for your truth. God, we pray, Lord, that, Lord, it truly would land on soft hearts today, God, that we'd receive your word. God, I know that there may be some parts of scripture in here that were tough to deal with, God, that that we wanted to spit out, we wanted to kick it to the side, we wanted to throw it away, but God, you want us to continue to wrestle with it because it may be your leading, God, and and what we need to be in obedience to you. I pray this morning, God, as we enter into this worship, Lord, God, that our perspective changes from what's going on around us and, and shifts to you, the author, the perfecter of our faith. Lord, we give you the rest of this morning, God. We pray you have your way in our hearts. And when it comes time for a response, Lord, I pray, God, for boldness to respond to your word this morning. We just praise you. You are worthy of our praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
things that I really want to pray for, maybe four things, is simply this, boldness. If you are needing boldness to declare the word of the Lord and you're wanting to be used by God and you need boldness, I'm going to ask that you would come forward to the altar so that we can anoint you and pray for you in an impartation of boldness over you. If you're lacking in joy and you're needing joy, I want you to come to the altar because we want to pray an impartation of joy over your life. And if you're wanting more of the Holy Spirit, again, the altar is open to you to come forward because we want to pray that impartation of the Holy Spirit upon you. And the fourth thing is simply this, signs, wonders, and miracles. And if God wants to follow this sermon and this service with signs, wonders, and miracles, we are open to it. So if you're needing a miracle, if you're needing healing, I'm going to encourage you to come forward because we'd love to anoint you and pray over you as well that God would move in your life and in your situation. Again, if, if none of these apply to you and you're, you're just right where you're at in your seat, I'm going to encourage you that as we continue on the song, that you worship and as soon as it's over, you guys are free to go. But if you want to respond this morning, I'm going to ask that my, my uh, prayer team would come up and that they would be in a ready position to begin to pray and to, uh, to pray over all of you. We love you guys. We're here for you. But allow God to minister to your heart. Be obedient to his leading this morning. Amen. Altars are open. You guys can come forward.
morning. We're going to continue to pray here. You're welcome to come and join us. But if not, I just want to speak a word of blessing over you today. May God's grace and mercy that are new every morning rest upon you. May peace guide your steps in Jesus' name.